Hi, everybody. Some of you I know and some of you I don't know. Um, let's welcome each other in all of our embodiments. Is um, honoring our own and each other's identities, as cultural and racial, sexual orientations, uh, different gender identities. Some may come from another country. We're all different ages, um, class, education, different abilities. So with care to open our hearts to our connections and respect for our differences, um, compassion and empathy for all different experiences that are present in this room. Zoom room, ha <laughs> look at that. It's so um, body-like to think that even slip into saying that this is a Zoom room. Um, I'd also like to do a land acknowledgement, which is a custom that I enjoy, especially I have something kind of sweet to say this day, that um, I'm speaking on land that uh, belonged to the Massachusetts Confederation, where the traditional custodians of the land are still around now. At the time of the colonies, um, there was a female sachem named Nata Watahunt, and I'm saying her name because um, her name has been lost. Like when you look on Wikipedia, the female sachem who sold uh, Somerville, the city where I live now, as it's now called, to the colonists, um, they say they call her the squaw sachem or the she sachem. Then they say that nobody knows her name, but I've been endeavoring to find out more, and I was able through friends to unearth her name and even to give it back to an indigenous scholar who didn't know it. Um, and Somerville has on its seal or up until now that it was legitimately purchased, but I know that Natawatahunt was under a lot of pressure and I don't know, she just lost two husbands in a row and I think it was important for her to retain good relations. She owned a lot of Boston and Charlestown and Cambridge too in this area. So, um, Maybe my husband is on a committee in the town that names things, and he's also really interested in this. And maybe name and name something after not to let her, rather than calling her the squaw sachem, which sounds a little weird. So, um, and there is a, you know, there was um, a lot that went on in those confrontations. So just lifting that up a little bit. Now, I was to give this talk in August, and I had set the frame of the body over a year ago. And oddly enough, in August, my body intervened, and I would, and ended up in the emergency room instead of giving the talk. I had an episode of gastritis um, due to trying to, or due to taking more ibuprofen than I should have for back pain. So I just think that's relevant. And I kept the title because I felt like somehow the universe intervened on, on a very uh, powerful level to make it both impossible to give the talk and also possible to give the talk because now my body is in a sufficient uh, harmony that I can sit here and deliver it. So I'd like us all to acknowledge that uh, each of our bodies is in a degree of sufficient harmony that our we're able to take this time um, to listen to what might be interesting to discuss about um, the fact that we're all uh, bodied, embodied somehow or other. And I find that um, some of the gold of Buddhism um, really had to do for me with um, discovering the awareness in my body and discovering the experiential body as a place of really interesting investigations, as a place of both pleasures and pains and offering ways to deal with being embodied and reflections on sort of the ultimate nature of what this is, as well as the cultural nature is kind of what my talk will be. And bodyfulness is a little bit in 
a tongue-in-cheek title is slightly um, reframing mindfulness. Like to me, doesn't bodyfulness sound a little more full than mindfulness? <laughs> it does to me, and it sounds a little more kind of sensed and alive, like bodyful, like beautiful, or like joyful. And that's not to really discount the you know the mind or the awareness or all of our thinking patterns or any of that that. They are in conversation with what we take to be our body. And it's also quite true that the body kind of influences all the conversations of our mind to a degree that the mind doesn't necessarily respect the body quite as much as, uh, as it ought to, I think, because we're not really um, aware of the embodiedness of our mind and the embodiedness of the way that we even think about things like things like up and down um, are even in our cells, but every cell seems to know which way is closer to this giant mass that we sit on from the earth. Um, and thinking of things as rooms or how to come in and out of a room. Um, it's a very complex operation that takes place a little bit under the level of our consciousness, but I'm, I'm becoming familiar with a person who has some disabilities and Sometimes coming in and out of a doorway is too complex an operation for the neurology, which just made me think of how incredible our bodies are and all the things they do to embody us, take care of us. Um, so I'd like to approach this as an exploratory conversation with great respect for each of you as embodied knowers in yourselves. Often when I give a talk, um, it's kind of nice to be just one little square on the screen because I do not like the feeling of everybody looking at me. And I don't really trust the feeling of me telling you a bunch of stuff. So I'd like to say this is a, an offering that I excavated into things that I think are interesting about being embodied um, as an offering to you and as an exploration and as a conversation with what you may already know as an invitation to maybe uh, reflect on something and bring some energy to the reflection so that it might open up something for you, I hope. Um, but if things that I say kind of don't work or something, please let that refine what you feel intuitively to be right. And it's really a gigantic topic. Like if we think about um, our bodies as so pervasive in my life, even just starting from what we eat and don't eat or can't eat or like to eat or want to eat and how many conversations and situations evolve around um, the ways that we keep our bodies alive through food, the conversations that I have before I invite someone over for a meal into what they eat or don't eat, um, what they prefer or don't prefer, and even thinking that our bodies are made out of the bodies of plants, um, the bodies in some cases, for some of us, of other living beings, and that things need to die for us to keep us alive, and that this is part of the nature of life on this planet, even if it's a plant giving up its existence um, to feed us or to create the bench that we're sitting on, and how often we don't really give the acknowledgement and gratitude for that process that allows our mind to think of itself so arrogantly. <laughs> and just as part of a Dharma talk, um, since part of Dharma is ethics, to contemplate the difference between gratitude and acknowledgement um, for such, uh, you know, blessings of the earth, and that our body being part of the earth needs the earth to continue versus a kind of, you know, narcissistic grabbiness and things have to die for me and I'll just, I don't care. I'll just um, take what I want. Or the experience of um, the way we move our bodies or don't move our bodies or can or cannot move and the results of that and how we feel when we move in certain ways or don't move in certain ways or can't move in certain ways or 
maybe now we can move in a way that we weren't able to move um, a week ago because we've been practicing modifying our body through exercise. There are so many other ways that I could go with this huge topic, but how to be with all of this uh, really is our practice, how to really feel into and understand with a more open heart, mind, and uh, maybe some kind of uh, deeper cognitive clarity, the process of our life through uh, just contemplating what it is to be an embodied being who happens to be alive right now. Our bodies also need different kinds of supports and shelter. And for some of us, we just need stairs and a door. For others of us, we may need a door that's wider and opens automatically, or we may need an elevator or a lift to move around in that embodiment, or that may be in the future for some of us. So bodies also have kind of needs for support and needs for connection, needs for love, needs for understanding. Our minds also have certain kinds of needs for support and understanding from each other and from the world. So I'd like to say too that the meditation practices and ethical and contemplative practices of Buddhism have been very important as supports for the mind and supports for well-being. It seems, um, I'm going to quote this, Dr. Ruby Gibson, um, who's a mixed blood indigenous and Mediterranean and Nisa person. I can't really see this very well, but um, I'll give you the title later if you're interested. It's called My Body, My Earth, the Practice of Somatic Archaeology. And she asserts that the body is always looking to heal. And I think our minds too are, all, are always looking to heal. And looking to heal within the particular context of uh, where our life arc is right now. Looking to heal within the context of the traces that each of us has brought into our present moment experiences. Like it may be what you ate recently or an encounter you had today or the bulk of your day, which still is impacting you a little bit. Um, it may be as a Haudenosaunee, say, the seven generations behind and even the seven generations that we're looking ahead since actually being present together right now may be part of something that we'd call like a wish or a hope for healing in the future or a wish or a hope for a track to place our feet on that was going to lead somewhere um, beautiful that otherwise we might not have access to. So this body, I think innately carries the sense of being alive inside us. That's something that we can access directly, um, I think, sense of life force. And the body also encodes a certain way of interpreting our world. And our experiential body may not actually be what the body is because the body is telling us what the body thinks we need to know. Like when you need to pee, it's not like you can go down in, a, in an x-ray and see your bladder there. You just get this sharp signal that cuts through other signals and tells you, you better go. And it protects you from having your bladder explode. You know? And it also, um, no matter what you're involved with, eventually that signal is designed to sort of like a needle through all the layers of your consciousness to impel you to go and uh, move yourself to a place where you can do this. So our bodies are in conversation with the natural world and in conversation with our minds and our hearts and our pasts and our world and with other people. In Buddhist practice, we're uh, invited to contemplate our death. And certainly it's, um, it's a topic, <laughs> our own and the death of everyone. Um, I recently 
uh, performed a death meditation guided by a Buddhist monk who seemed to be Swiss or German or uh, one of those nationalities wearing the robes of a monk, uh, orange. And he invited us to picture ourselves uh, on a bed in a room with white linen sheets and that we were all alone and that the last family member had left and then proceeded to invite us to um, experience whatever we experienced on the news of that this would be our final hour and, um, and very skillfully led at least my mind through, you know, emptying the contents of this life, like the identity that I was and the stories that I had about myself and the stories that I had about everything, sort of emptying it into the zero of the unknown of death, or you didn't use those words, but something like that. And I had a pretty powerful sense of what letting go into that might feel like experimentally. It felt um, quite interesting. And I also noticed that um, this man who officially doesn't have a family, or at least as a monk, you know, uh, doesn't um, think of sort of being in a messy room with like all your family around you telling you how much they love you or somebody holding your hand, dying then or dying in that way. And it made me question to some degree, this is a questioning that I do a lot anyway, but is um, in this tradition of insight meditation, we're inheriting a tradition that was mediated by like privileged men without families, just like Western philosophy is sort of the same. You know, there's all these debates about whose point of view uh, is philosophy being done from and what happens when women are different uh, people in different social categories um, invent philosophies or think think hard thoughts you know um, and it made me think about how through every phase of life our bodies or our status or our location in society influences our experience of our body and our embodiment so differently what most people report being afraid of, um, one of the two is dying alone. The other one is dying in pain, which we may not be able to mitigate completely. But why not have a death meditation where you give yourself some love, um, love around you, helping you to let go, not just toughing it out, you know, through, oh, my God, I'm going to die, you know, in, in your individual consciousness. Does being loved well make death less scary, it might, you know, to have people say what you meant to them, how particular you were, and how much they love you, and that it's okay to let go, like, would that be a possible death meditation? There's a um, Black woman named Alua Arthur, who is a death doula, or someone who accompanies people, or helps people prepare for death, and she talks about appreciating the person's life and then uh, then goes through into a more traditional Buddhist style meditation, like your body feeling the dirt and feeling the decomposition and finding the skeleton and then merging with the earth at the end. But it's really very complex when we think about it as um, dying as the identity that we were, um, how long that carries out and how much it inflicts everything. Alua Arthur also talks about what would be a good death within a racist system. Like how can we have a good death? And how can we have a good death within medicalized death and things like that? These are questions that we're all, you know, not all, but are being contemplated. For example, Arthur talks about someone, uh, a family who wanted their loved ones, um, black hair braids, to be released and to, because they wanted her natural hairstyle and a, a funeral director who didn't know how to undo the braids just shaved that person's head. It was very painful for um, the family that that happened, that there wasn't the kind of understanding. Also that, you know, hospice care tends to be offered more to people in white bodies than people in black bodies. And the reasons being very complicated that um, is it that more uh, solace and support is offered to white people or 
is it that there are barriers to trust? If you're in a black body, that hospice care means that they're not going to really support you to be comfortable, really. Um, many black activists don't support the right to die because it seems that the system is a lot happier with just kill black people. <laughs> So there are kind of complexities to think through or feel through with our hearts and understanding like where our embodiments are going and what the specifics of our life might be. And being aware that there doesn't seem to be access to a life that doesn't have particular kinds of perceptions and nodes and notions and um, where we're constantly being influenced in so many ways. Um, and we're invited really to open our hearts to understanding the way each other is influenced and even that understanding the way each other is influenced by sort of larger forces um, helps us to understand our own lives in specific and in very deep ways, even as a particular expression of the universe, you might say, which I think the Dharma is pointing to. I remember when my dad was in hospice and they didn't want to send him to the hospital to get a catheter. He couldn't pee and they, the hospice sent him to people. And because I have a sister who's a doctor, she, was a, she just called an ambulance and she knew that the hospice didn't want to pay for the ambulance. They would have rather let his bladder burst there because of the money. So it's not just any. Um, so fortunately, she was educated and she knew the system and she knew what to do. She knew she could force them to do it and to pay, but otherwise it, it might have been a much more serious, painful death for him, even as a white male. Or the story of my sister's friend, who's a black woman physician who had a baby and had been working COVID and she had a stroke after she had the baby. So even a really highly educated person in a, in a black woman's body may not have the best outcomes that's been shown across the board, regardless of income or privilege, that our body takes on impacts from society, um, impacts from not being loved or not being seen clearly. And I'm sure that that's happened to actually everyone in this room, even if most of us are quite privileged relative to others, that you know uh, what it's like to be you know, thought of as a man or a woman and treated in a certain way because of it, that doesn't, um, doesn't really honor the fullness of, of who you are. And out of that vulnerability, I think we can expand to understand the experiences of each other and to really want to um, exert some kind of protective force um, as part of our Dharma practice as best we can. Like, I also offered that example about the Shi Sachem where I feel like I was able to do something that I didn't even require me to leave the house, but just to have asked a bunch of people and um, set some people searching and somebody found an old pamphlet in some of the historical society and I was able to give it back to the indigenous group. So in contemplating our bodyfulness, um, you know, a certain reflective capacity is important and it's not to be like we have to do it all in this non-intellectual way or non-conceptual way. Sometimes it seems like the Dharma practice is all about just meeting sensations without any kind of filter, but actually our sensations are already filtered for us by our bodies. But what I'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about the internal experiential um, body and how our history gets graven onto our bodies internally that um, say, you know, I've been talking about things that are largely uh, difficult and trauma is an important subject in psychology therapy and um, in Dharma practice as one of the varieties that causes suffering, one of the varieties of experience that's suffering. And I have a cousin who is a trauma therapist, a psychotherapist, and she says it's really it's like a brain injury. It's a physical injury um, to your system. And it causes a blank for different kinds of distortions in the way we process information, the way we process um, 
our sensations and physical world and input. And it can occur to all kinds of degrees and all kinds of levels. I don't know if any of you have read the book, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem, but um, there are chapters on the trauma of white people, the trauma of black people, the trauma of police. And Menachem's idea is that police are trained and also they are, have a dangerous job. And some of the shootings that police do are because they're having a trauma reaction that completely bypasses their thinking mind or their ability to reason. Um, it provides a kind of space of forgiveness and understanding, but it's also controversial because it seems like, you know, sometimes trauma can be cited as a way of having people not be accountable for their behavior. And that's really difficult too. Like recently I had a friend had an argument with a friend who said something. I mean, I felt like I was walking into it in the most innocent, you know, way. And that friend said something to me that was really hurtful. And then afterwards they said, well, I was triggered. And it was like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, are you sorry? <laughs> like that. But I'd like to take it as a non, in a non-frivolous way to say that um, usually the way to heal trauma, um, as it's understood now, is actually to go through body sensations and to feel uh, the contractions and to find your way through the experiential body um, into healing. So this book, uh, My Body, My Earth, um, by Dr. Ruby Gibson, is the practice of somatic archaeology. So as she says, the body's always looking to heal. And she found that many of her therapy patients came back again and again with the same symptoms for many years. And it was because of these memory patterns that were encoded in their bodies um, as patterns of sensation. And she says, the body's language isn't language. Like you can't think your way out of some of these um, maps or body patterns. It's actually through sensation that you can discover and unlock and heal some of the traumas that you're carrying. So I feel like the, this really fits so beautifully with the Dharma practice of being a sensation in the body, even being with uncomfortable sensation and finding a way to either be with it or intentionally move attention to somewhere where you can pay attention and then kind of um, their ways in um, called somatic experiencing that um, have very specific patterns of moving into and out of areas of um, difficult sensation. So drawing up into awareness um, places in our body and uh, there's all these emotional and cognitive patterns that are associated with it. drawing it into awareness, being with it, and often the support from the skilled uh, helper, teacher, therapist, allowing uh, those experiences to digest. And it's become pretty established that um, there's such a thing as inherited uh, pain or suffering. I don't just the word trauma. I keep using it. This, I don't want this to be just only a trauma talk because I'd also like to lift up the beauty of being able to be with it, to heal it. And, um, as I said earlier, sometimes having a, a practice context or a person or a skilled uh, therapist or even just someone who really cares about you um, to be there with you well, to help you through stuff that's hard. I mean, that's just an old human thing. It's not, it's not necessarily a you know, fancy dancy thing that we just figured out now in the modern time <laughs> because we're so superior. You know, we're actually the same bodies as we ever were. Um, so some of these being with people in, in each other's pain as a healing practice is ancient. Um, but I'm thinking about, you know, the, uh, the experience of my grandmother who uh, had her child taken away because she uh, committed an infidelity in her marriage in the 1930s. And she uh, got divorced from the family and disappeared. And how this experience affected my mother, affected my sisters and me, um, even on a biological level, they say that if something happens to a woman while she's pregnant, then the eggs, if it's a female baby in there, a female fetus, that the eggs that that fetus 
develops carry some of the traces of that trauma from the mother. And so that sometimes trauma even skips a generation that your mother's mother, um, if she had something really uh, difficult happen to her, um, you may need to heal some of that in your body, in your mental patterns, in your emotional patterns, and things that you do again and again that don't seem to serve you or don't seem to work anymore. And what, um, what can body awareness help us to um, feel into some of those places, to feel into the, like encouraging us to be able to find the place where it's tight, um, find some of the stuckness in our heart and just rest with it as stuckness at the time not forcing it open, but inviting um, some expression. And it doesn't always get resolved cognitively or sometimes it just resolves because we were willing to hold it like a, like a baby, you know? So her, so Ruby Gibson's somatic archeology span is I notice something going on. I sense it through my body. I feel the associated emotion with some of the kind of awareness of lovingness and openness as uh, we've just encouraged in the body meditation. I feel the associated emotion. I interpret the sensation. I kind of say like, I, think, I know where this is from. I, sometimes that can be through imagery or sometimes directly knowing. And then I reconcile, I reconcile with it. And the reconciliation that we have, with it, that uh, can be a really deeply corrective experience. Um, to digest things that no longer serve. Like the trauma reaction is actually protection. Um, you know, as they say, you know, the, a rock veteran that hits the dirt when they hear a noise, well, that was adaptive at one time. It doesn't serve them now. Um, so there can be sometimes ways of healing uh, trauma through um, these experiential, very body-based types of therapy. And the blessing of some of this is that um, we can start to really trust our intuition and trust our gut and actually be listening for the signals from that gut. You know, and there was a column in the New York Times this Sunday, I think, you know, one of those dating love, love advice columns about somebody saying that um, they felt funny about the person they were dating and they trusted their gut and walked away from you know, the invitation, the person wanted to marry them on the second date or something, and that set off some alarm, and they decided that they were going to trust their gut, and they walked away, and then there's a story about why that was a good thing. Or just casually, back to how universal this embodiment experience is, I was reading a thing about a, a mother of two young twins who were supposed to, you know, it was clickbait underneath something, of, you know, the two most beautiful twins in the world and their mother and how she guides their modeling career. And their mother said, um, when she was dealing with promoters, you know, she said she first trusted the girls to say if they wanted to model, like she wasn't trying to push them into it to make money, that they liked it. But that whenever she was dealing with agents or promoters and stuff, that if she felt anything funny about them, she wouldn't work with them. So she, her advice to other mothers, um, trust your gut. So out of the trauma zone to say that our embodiment actually includes uh, a really uh, beautiful structure of nerves and um, sensors that are toward compassion and toward empathy that it's, and people always talk about the hardwired this or that, like we are hardwired also for compassion and empathy and those nerves um, are always there because they also coordinate certain things about like how we digest and stuff like that. So in evolutionary psychology, some of the recent work, um, I've talked about this before, but human beings evolved to love each other and to collaborate. And we're even equipped with a really rapid nervous system assessment of each other, like whether we feel trusting or not, whether someone seems likely to help us or not. And you know, that can go wrong. It's very complex, as, you know, as we've been exploring. But there's also um, a way that our biology is geared to um, have an instinct to care for each other. It's thought that it 
comes because our because our ba- the human baby is so vulnerable because it needs to have this big brain and it has to be born at a more premature stage kind of compared with most animals because our head is so huge. Our mothers would crack apart if we were able, you know, if they carried us in their, you know, because we're walking too, we had to kind of close up down there and so the baby wouldn't fall out. So both of those combinations mean that the human infant is, is an extremely vulnerable proposition and all human beings have this instinct to care. And the, our vagus nerve is loaded up as this um, evolutionary biologist says with oxytocin receptors, the source of feelings of devotion, uh, the willingness to sacrifice and the ability to trust. Our evolutionary history produces cells under the surface of everyone's skin that fire in response to the slow and soothing touch of compassion. So actually compassion, love, sacrifice, devotion, and beauty are wired into our nervous systems. And can we feel that? Can we kind of start to own that as an embodied being and start to see what happens if you let that understanding sink through uh, for a minute? So this feeling of sensations and moving into the body is traditionally what's offered as the first foundation of mindfulness. And some of the modern applications of uh, body awareness, like MBSR for pain relief, um, helping people to be able to be with sensations of pain in a different way, because sort of a little bit short-circuiting the the habitual mental reactions like, oh no, and replacing that with the calm of mindfulness. And even there, um, it's a friend of mine, Saida Vallejo, who's a Colombian uh, MBSR teacher, discovered early in her career something that has been developed much more as trauma-informed mindfulness. But she was working with women who were in a shelter, um, often uh, from domestic violence, and she realized that no, you could, you know, part of the strength of MBSR was that it moved through the body in the same pattern. So it provided the basis for countless medical studies because it was so standardized. But the standardized math did not work for women who'd been battered or sexually abused because they needed to actually have the freedom to move their attention through their bodies in any way and not have to say, like, go through that. I mean, I've had moments of embarrassment as a meditation teacher, like, now place your attention in the pelvic area. I'm thinking, like, oh, should I be saying that? You know, it's a very vulnerable area, and we don't want to necessarily depersonalize our entire history through our bodies. So um, what Saida decided, and she got into some like, trouble with the powers that be for modifying the uh, curriculum of mindfulness this way. She and a, um, also a Latina friend came up with a handbook for teaching mindfulness for people with trauma. It was very helpful for them at that point. But the agency of moving the attention around and finding places where the mind could rest actually became very healing, not necessarily going into the trauma per se. Um, so with that, I want to just say that we're each allowed to discover our own structures for meditation um, and not necessarily tough it out or be with pain or some of those things. Uh, Raya Stevens will be giving a talk on that um, coming up and I think she'll be giving a really good talk about that. So I recommend that you uh, attend it if you're interested. Also not to make mindfulness of the body into like a big thing that you feel like you have to have to do it. There's this uh, powerful statement by a teacher from Thailand named Ajahn Mun saying, do not abandon the body. And I remember when I first heard that, and I felt like that means you have to be leashed to the body all the time. The body. I, I've been trying to not say the body because it sounds like there's some giant like inflatable balloon that everyone can look, at, you know, the body. Mindfulness of your body. I mean, I, I'm just doing that right now. There's reasons why the body is fine, but um, so that image of the giant body came to me. And I thought, oh, well, I guess try to say your body. But anyway, he said, do not abandon the body. But that doesn't mean um, that you have to be like wedded 
to experiencing your body every second. Like I think there's a sort of enhancement to our life that comes from deliberately remembering to inhabit our body. But um, it's okay to let the body and mind play separately <laughs> at times. Like our ability to like fly into the past and the future is really creative and valuable. Um, and it's a natural aspect of our mind. So I don't, I don't think that we should demonize it quite the way it seems like um, demonize might be a strong word, but deplore it maybe. Like when we're trying to learn how to meditate and we spend some long periods of distraction for something or other, like that's not um, bad behavior for a meditator. It's just something to start to know and understand and recognize as another part of the way that we are alive. Um, we need to be able to think about things that are far away from us and remember people who aren't here and. Uh, possibly contemplate situations in the abstract. Uh, what does this mean? Do I want to stay involved with this? Um, even getting away from something to be able to think about it, do you know? Like, so I don't think we have to be locked in in this way. And it also seems that too much not being anchored in our body is, is not necessarily so healthy. Like, as we spend more and more time on our screens, like, do you remember when um, there weren't cell phones, anybody? <laughs> you know, and today I forgot my phone and I had to drive to Brookline without my phone, <laughs> like without the map or without the, you know, the possibility of listening to a podcast or something like that. It was half an hour in the car without my phone and I could feel the difference. And I thought, well, it was probably good for me to have this deprivation and not have that British voice telling me, now 100 yards, turn left, that kind of thing. But it remains to be seen, you know, what our love of being disembodied and getting sucked into a screen is going to do to us. It seems that it's not helped children so far um, socially. It's helped shy people, I think. But there seems to be extremes of disembodiment that might be to avoided, be, be to be avoided. So in the last part of the talk, I want to return to the feeling that our bodies are nature and our bodies in some way um, include so much of the cosmos. The Buddha said, um, it's not, this, some of you have been uh, to many Dharma talks, may have heard this beautiful quotation before, but he's um, talking to someone who's been exploring the universe and hasn't found the end of the universe, like hasn't been able to get past out the edge of it, which reminds me of astronomy now, like the incredible distances of outward exploration. And um, even the beginning of the universe hasn't been found, you know. Um, I tell you, friend, it's not possible by traveling to know or see or reach a far end of the cosmos where one does not get born, age, die, pass away, or reappear. But at the same time, I tell you, there's no making an end of suffering and stress without reaching the end of the cosmos. And it's just within this fathom-long body with its perception and intellect that I declare that there is the full cosmos, the origination of the cosmos, the cessation of the cosmos, and the path of practice that leads to the cessation of the cosmos. So it's not without reaching the end of the universe that there's a release from stress. Um, now, I don't you know. Release from stress comes from entering the body to some degree, as I've been trying to discuss. But I also feel that there's a way that our body does reflect the cosmos and that what we experience is in some really odd way and emerges from the nature of life itself. So all of the stuff, the distraction, the pain, the things we can't help, you know, the relationships we'd rather not be part of, all the inequities, the system that seems broken, all that stuff, um, as we feel it and receive it and struggle to make it better uh, with the energies that we have as we try to find healing for ourselves and others, um, there's also some peace for me and real interest and joy in imagining that um, we really are made up of everything or almost everything or some subset of everything. 
um, how did we get born at all? And how is it that we're sitting there talking about talking about this on Zoom? Like how much of it can we really know? Um, just as a, um, there's a, I was reading a book by a physicist who's trying to popularize some of the deeper edges and of um, what physicists are thinking about now. And he was saying that humans don't exist in the fundamental properties of the, of the cosmos. They're not, we're, we're not to be found in the elementary particles, but somehow being human emerges. Kind of the way if you have a bunch of people and you're choosing teams, there weren't any teams before the teams are chosen, but then after the teams have been chosen, there's something that's existing called a team. And still it's just a group of people. So the way that we live is that our minds choose certain aspects of life and kind of gets attached to that because the cosmos or the you know, physical reality outside us keeps repeating certain interactions with our bodies. So our mind organizes the world into concepts and entities because it's important to us and important for our survival. Um, even concepts are probably kind of repeated elaborations on certain repeated experiences that maybe we can understand that kind of in a certain way, the ways we think about things. And our sense of who we are most likely comes uh, from observing other people around us and from how other people relate to us. So we're all part of an interactive experience here together and we wouldn't be the way we are if we weren't interacting with a lot more than what it seems like we're interacting with at any given moment. And it seems still too that when we get still and when we get present, there's a feeling of this boundless cosmos that we don't aren't necessarily able to register or registering all the time. And I'd like to say that whether that's healing or not, Maybe up to you whether you care about that or not. But I do really like it. And I do really feel like it's meaningful to just touch upon it, even though you can't really bring it out or you can't really say what it is or you can't describe it, that um, it's actually a part of our life that is quite beautiful. And it may be what I'd be willing to die into uh, when my time comes. even as I want to live um, this life as best I can. Um, so I'll close, uh, it's traditional in Dharma talks to close with the quotation. I am going to do it. Um, it's from that physicist, uh, Carlo Rovelli, and saying, I have already drunk deep of the bittersweet contents of this cup. And if an angel were to come for me right now, saying, Carlo, it's time. I would not ask to be left even long enough to finish the sentence. I would simply smile and follow. Thank you so much for being here and for providing me with the reason to um, explore this topic. My heart right now feels kind of fizzy, um, really quite alive. So um, I appreciate that you invited me to speak. Thanks. Should we just um, meditate for a bit or feel into our embodiments and our minds, activities, with appreciation and respect? And um, yeah, I can now soon let go of the role of uh, speaking and if anything I said was uplifting, helpful, or insightful, I'm glad. If anything I said was uh, not something that you could go along with, me, I'm happy for you not to. Um, so I would hope that it was as helpful as Anne has said. Um, thank you.
May we abide lovingly with ourselves and with one another. May we contribute to peace in this world, to the well being of ourselves, those we are close to, those we don't know. May we navigate difficulty with grace and as much as we can help each other to do that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.